back on the UOD campus. The snow is a little bit different from what you are seeing around here. So there's been a little bit of a change of pace in terms of material. The research that we do is very device oriented. Materials play an important role, and I'll try to highlight those important roles today in terms of isotopic enrichment and electronic mobility and uh, chemical purity. But basically what we're trying to do is make electronic devices where we can build a cage around a single electron or a collection of electrons and control individual quantum states and look at the time dependence and, and look at these systems for quantum information applications. And so you've all heard of this field of quantum computing, quantum information science and technology. It's probably the most famous for this notion that you could use a quantum computer to factor large numbers and, for example, break RSA encryption. Uh, but there are more down-to-earth applications of quantum science that have really taken off and have led to new technologies and even little startup companies. The one area is quantum sensing, using the fact that quantum systems are very sensitive to the environment. Uh, you can actually apply them to detect magnetic fields, detect temperatures, detect electric fields, strain fields, for example. And so there's a whole range of different areas of research that are being explored, you know, ranging from the very far out application 20, 30 years down the line of, of doing brute force quantum computing, uh, near term goals of quantum sensing, and in between there fits something like quantum simulation, trying to use intermediate scale quantum systems to simulate real materials or calculate ground states of a complicated Hamiltonian, for example. So in terms of quantum computing hardware, you basically want a system in the laboratory, a two-level system that can be experimentally controlled and accessed and read out. And there are many different ways to do this. Some of the you know, most promising approaches are based on trapped ions. There's a lot of work here at UMB and at Duke and, and elsewhere. Uh, using internal degrees of freedoms of atoms or ions, those quantum states to make quantum bits. A lot of early work was done using nuclear magnetic resonance and uh, synthesized molecules with interacting spins, right, and controllable Hamiltonians. There's work on quantum computing. And you know, we're mainly interested in condensed matter kind of approaches to quantum physics. And so here, there's been a lot of progress in the area of superconducting devices. So Vlad and targets here at Maryland working on this. There's a approach based on using the spin degree of freedom of an electron to encode a quantum bit. And then there's this very kind of young and it's still a growing area of topological quantum computing. It's not even clear the topological quantum bit, but there's a notion that maybe you could have topological protection and work in this kind of state space where you have a protected system that's robust and conserves. So for this hour, I'm going to drill into you know, spin-based quantum computing and tell you about that research area. But that, that's what I work on. I'd be happy to take any questions during the talk if you just want to raise your hand. Ask me to slow down or talk in more detail, that's fine. Or if you prefer, you can save your question to the end. Okay. Uh, so let me just talk about the basics first of you know, what a spin qubit is. So imagine you take an electron somehow and you can trap it in space. And the electron has charge, so we always think about it in terms of classical electronics, but also has a spin degree of freedom. And to use the spin of the electron to make a quantum bit, we're basically going to take that electron and put it in a large magnetic field so that the spin up and spin down states have been split in energy by the Zeeman energy. And these two states, spin down and spin up, are going to correspond to state 0 and 1 of our quantum bit. And the idea for a spin qubit then is that you have this electron, the spin is the qubit, it's the degree of freedom that we want to control, and you basically use the toolbox of electron spin resonance to drive Rabi oscillations and control the quantum state of that single electron. So it seems very simple. Yes? Uh, how, big, how big is your Zeeman splitting? Zeeman splitting is uh, you know, about 58 micro EV per tesla is the Bohr magneton. So we're talking G equals 2 for electron and silicon. It's about 120 micro EV per tesla. And so we're generally going to work around a half a tesla. We'll have ESR frequencies in our systems that are in the 20 gigahertz range. To put that at scale in terms of how fast you have to drive it. So it's not optical for our system, it's all microwave. That comes in handy actually for experiments because you can just pipe signals in with coax cables and, <laughs> and it's kind of convenient that way. And anyways, feel, feel free to interrupt as long as it doesn't get too obnoxious. Uh, you can just raise your hands if a question comes up. But thanks for the first question and breaking the ice. So this is the simplest qubit, single electron qubit. There are other types of qubits based on spin where you have a more complicated state space. An example is a two electron system 
where you use a singlet and triplet spin states to encode the degree of freedom of your qubit. And the motivation for doing this is that you work in this basis of the m sub s equals zero singlet and triplet states. Those two states are insensitive to overall fluctuations in the magnetic field. Whereas if I look at the single spin, uh, the Zeeman energy that you just asked about, right, is sensitive to the total magnetic field. And so there are fluctuations in the total magnetic field that leads to dephasing and decoherence. But if you work in a state space where m sub s equals zero, you're insensitive to overall magnetic field fluctuations. And that's called a decoherence free subspace. And so sometimes you can make more complicated quantum systems and actually get a little bit of additional protection uh, by paying that cost of having you know, more complicated systems. In this case, it's two electrons instead of one. And there are other examples now of, say, three and four electrons in the that have been proposed in the literature. I'm mainly going to talk about you know, the single spin devices today. And in terms of a roadmap for really making a quantum technology out of any of these systems that we talked about, trapped ions or molecular based uh, NMR approaches, you want a quantum system that can be initialized. You know, for example, we have spin up and spin down. We need a way to prepare the electron spin in some well defined state at time t equals zero. We need a way to read out the orientation of single spins and to control the spin state. You know, using electron spin resonance is the example I gave for a single spin. But we also need a way to couple qubits together, right? To implement two qubit gate interactions. And the way that's commonly done with spins is to use exchange coupling and to push the wave functions of these electrons together to turn on a J coupling momentarily and kind of turn it back off. We want long decoherence times. And preferably, we'd like to do all this in a system that's, that's scalable. And here's where I think you know, semiconductors can really shine in terms of the technology, in terms of cramming you know, many qubits on a small amount of real estate. And so what's pretty impressive is you know, looking back over the past uh, two decades since this seminal proposal by Loss and DiVincenzo to use the spin degree of freedom to make a quantum bit, most of these things have been checked off here. We can prepare a spin in the ground state pretty easily by just going to high magnetic fields and letting the system thermalize, just relax into the ground state. You can initialize the spin that way. We can read out spin using a process called speed HR conversion. Uh, we have these methods for quantum control. And one of the very nice features of spins and semiconductors is that they can have extremely long spin lifetimes. So you can prepare a spin any excited state, and you know, in the right material system, that excited state can live for seconds, tens of seconds, or even minutes if you're looking at nuclear spin states and semiconductors. Okay. So they have a long quantum memory. And uh, what we're really excited about is that if we can make a few of these devices work well, you can imagine just applying conventional microfabrication techniques to crank out many devices. So I have a question in the middle. Uh, I'm just curious, what's the longest spin lifetime uh, so far? I think. So it, 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 it's kind of a, a long-winded answer because it depends on a lot of details. It depends not only on the material and, say, the strength of the spin we're coupling, it depends on the strength of the electron phonon coupling because when the spin relaxes, you need to lose that energy into some kind of bath, and so the phonon loads become important. And there's also a characteristic energy dependence. The relaxation rate depends on whether the Zeeman energy is small or large. And this is the subject of many PRLs that I can point you to. <laughs> but generally, no seconds. I think the record for our system is a minute now. 57 seconds, really close to it. And that's a recent nature communication paper that came out from Dominic Zubolsky, where they sort of worked in a nice regime where um, Zeeman splitting was small, the phonon density states are small, but they're not yet hyperphonic, kind of limited in terms of the lifetime. Is there another question here? Uh, so I think you mentioned that you can use the spin to charge conversion for the readout of the spin. Right. But can that work like for single spin? Yes. I'll show you some data for that later on. Remind me if I if I forget. Okay, that's a nice way to do it. You can do it for both singlet and triplet readout and for single spin readout. So the famous method called the Elzerman readout technique that's based on coupling a spin one half of Zeeman split to a Fermi C and having energy dependent tumbling depending on whether the state is up or down. Any other questions? Good. Okay. So this is kind of where we're at. And what I want to do, since this is a pretty different turf than you know, high pressure flows on crystal growth, is I really enjoy <laughs> this thing about diamond and bell cells and whether there's a way to do that too. 
I'm going to talk about, you know, about the physics of quantum dots and just kind of get you on the same page. There's a few things that you want to take away in terms of the device physics that you know are necessary to understand you know, the starting points of these experiments. So there'll be a, just a brief 10-15 you know, minute physics overview, the physics of small scale single electron devices and the basic energy scales that I want you to leave the room with. Okay, just two or three things. And now we're going to dig into how these are made. This is a you know, materials workshop. I'm going to talk about both the header structure, the silicon and silicon germanium header structure, and the features of that that are important for making these devices. I also want to talk about how the electrons are caged with the gate electrodes, about how we can trap them and put them close together so that we can have controlled interactions. And then if there's time, I'll just flash up some recent results that kind of take advantage of you know, isotopic enrichment in silicon, um, synthetics can recover and what we can do with that in terms of achieving long range you know, spin spin interactions and, and moving the steel forward. Okay? Good. So let's start off, you know, very gentle. What's a quantum dot? Quantum dot is any system, you know, that's lithographically made or chemically made that isolates a single electron or confines a single electron in three dimensions. So the early examples of this deal are based on a single molecule devices where you can synthesize a chemical structure and uh, make you know, single molecule transistors or C60 between two gate electrodes, for example, is an example of a, a single molecule device. There's work that's been done on semiconductor systems where you take a three dimensional semiconductor and etch it, right, make it smaller and, and make a pillar to basically isolate electrons in space, and then you can use a quantum well system to provide further confinement in, say, the Z direction in this picture. So these are called vertical semiconductor quantum dots. <coughs> Another example that's you know, pretty famous, kind of before my time, I think it's Muji Belendi at uh, MIT can synthesize, I think, the cadmium carbonide <coughs> nanocrystals, right? And there's a very famous picture of all these test tubes full of nanoparticles of different colors based on their size. But you can have particle and box quantization and nanoparticles. And these can be metal or semiconductor. And I'm going to focus on a specific class of quantum dots. These are called lateral quantum dots because we're going to use growth, heterostructured growth, to give electronic confinement in a plane and then to control the confinement of the electrons in the other two spatial dimensions, we're going to use lithographically defined gate electrodes like these that are shown here to push the electrons around and actually build a cage around them. And so the quantum well is going to give us confinement in Z, and these gate electrodes give us confinement in the, the XY plane of the structure. And the reason that this is kind of a nice approach is because once this is made, and once this is made, it's very hard to tune the properties, right? We're not going to change the size of the nanoparticle after the thing is made in a low temperature kind of experiment. But by adjusting these gate voltages, we can change the shape of the cage of the electrons trapped in. Think of it that way. So it's a really, you know, very kind of tunable system where you have a lot of control over the parameters that are important in the experiment. Quantum dots are often called artificial atoms. I already mentioned, you know, 3D confinement. Um, there's a discrete energy level spectrum, right? If you probe the uh, emission or absorption spectrum, let's say hydrogen, see something like this. You can take two atoms and put them together and demonstrate, you know, molecular bonding. And the same kind of experiments can be done with quantum dots. We're going to take an electron, we're going to trap it in an experimentally made you know, nanostructure confinement potential. Instead of using light to probe the electronic structure, we'll perform transport measurements. We'll measure the current through a device as a function of voltage or energy equivalently. And we can probe through measurements of conductance the local density of states in that system and resolve through measurements of conductance a discrete electronic energy energy levels that are a result of the confinement of the electrons. And these are particle in a box quantum states that we're probing through a current measurement. Right? And we can also make devices where we take two quantum dots and push them together. And if there's enough wave function overlap, we can make a molecule, something like an artificial molecule, and really tune the amount of hybridization between these two artificial atoms, right? From sort of a delocalized regime to a, a localized regime by adjusting the barrier height between these two. Okay. So well, there's some similarities or some big differences between quantum dots and atoms. You know, the first thing is scale. 
instead of having external line scales, we have to make things with say EV lithography, etching, or something like that, and clean your bike. And, and that means that we're limited to tens of nanometers today. You know, practically, maybe you can push harder with STM, but to really make many devices, you're going to be in the 10, 20 nanometer range on a good day. <laughs> you know, typically 50 nanometers on a typical day. That means instead of having electron volt energy scales, this comes back to your question about Zaman splitting. We're going to have typical energy scales that are in the 100 of microvolt to milli electron volt range because our box is bigger right, than the box created by you know, a nucleus in a real atom. Right? So the uh, particle in the box energy scale is going to be quite a bit smaller. This forces us to work at low temperature. You know, all these quantum experiments are pretty much done at millikelvin temperatures, so that KT is much less than this characteristic particle in the box energy scale. Also, the electron is uh, working in, say, 3-5 semiconductors. The electron has a small effective mass. So that wave function is pretty delocalized you know, compared to, say, a donor or some other kind of system like this. Like in a real atomic system, we have an angstrom length scale. In gallium arsenide, you think of like the Fermi wavelength of the electron, the natural size of that electron. It's much larger than an atom in free space, right? And that means that the electron trapped in our dot its wave function overlaps with many lattice nuclei. And that's going to be very important to in today's lecture in terms of spin coherence and what that means for, say, hyperfine coupling in these devices. And also, spin orbit coupling can be you know, important depending on which system you're working in. Carbon or silicon, it, it doesn't matter that much. Indium antimonide, it's a big deal, right? So by tuning which system we're working with to make our quantum dots in, we can really you know, adjust all these parameters, hyperfine coupling, spin orbit coupling. So on and so forth. Okay. Two pieces of physics I want you to walk away you know, from the room with. Everyone knows about a capacitor. U is equal to CV. Energy is one half CV squared, right? So you can calculate the energy to charge a capacitor. And uh, think about a quantum dot as being a nanoscale capacitor. And then you can ask yourself, right, if I take a quantum dot and connect it up to two electrodes, two probes on my DMM, digital multimeter, and I try to pass a current through it, what are the energy scales involved in changing the electron number or charging the quantum dot by one electron? And so this is called pool blockade and charging. And the answer kind of boils down to this quantity. It's called an electrostatic charging energy. I think this is one and a half CV squared, but we're just going to add one electron right, um, to, the, to the device. The energy cost that we have to pay to add or remove an electron from this quantum dot goes like e squared over 2c. Okay. So if you're working with a typical capacitance, you know, nanofarad, microfarad, you don't think about this physics. It's kind of irrelevant in day-to-day -day life. But if you have a, a nanostructure system, you know, where characteristic length scale is 10 nanometers, the capacitance can be extremely small, 10 to the minus 18 farads. And what that does is it pushes this charging energy up into the 5 or 10 milli electron volt range. And that means that if you want to change the electron number on the dot, you need to pay that price. You need to pay this charging energy to go from one to two to three electrons, so on and so forth. And that means that you know, charge is really quantized on these dots at low temperatures. If you have five electrons on the dot, it's not going to fluctuate to six or four because there's this gap. There's this charging gap that you have to pay. And what this leads to, if you look at measurements of, say, conductance through a quantum dot, as a function of a voltage on a nearby gate electrode, you'll see what are called Coulomb oscillations. And these peaks in conductance correspond to points where you tune the energy of an n electron state into resonance with, say, an n plus one electron state perfectly, right? And right at that point in gate voltage space, you can change the electron number. But if you move away from it, you have to pay this cost. And that cost is high at low temperatures, and basically you'll have you know, very small conductance between these peaks because of this charging. So this is not really you know, a quantum effect other than charge is quantized. It's a size effect that really shows up at these small length scales. Now the quantum effect that's important is that if you put electrons in a box, instead of having you know, free electron dispersion relation or band structure, we'll have discrete particle in a box energy states, right? And now you can think about the energy level spectrum for a quantum dot. Uh, this is typically done in kind of a non-interactive picture where I take the quantum dot, I consider a bunch of energy levels, and each energy level can be filled with a spin-up and a spin-down electron. That's it. 
And if we adjust the voltage on this gate electrode that I showed here on the previous slide, all that does is it shifts the energy levels up and down in unison. So it's like a whole ladder of states that just shifts up and down, and uh, each ladder step can be filled with two electrons, spin up, spin down. So you just add electrons, you know, two at a time, and consecutively work your way up this energy level diagram. Okay. So I, I mentioned, you know, looking at back at this slide, instead of looking at you know emission or absorption spectrum, you can measure conductance to probe these discrete energy level states. And that's kind of best viewed in this kind of energy level diagram where you think about the particle in the box states for your quantum dot and they're coupled to two Fermi reservoirs that correspond to your voltage probes. You know, on your DMM, for example, right? Those are filled up to a Fermi level and if an energy level associated with a quantum dot is within this source range bias window, then you can have single electron transport through the quantum dot. And so if you look at this energy level diagram, then as I raise this, chemical potential up, every time it crosses a dashed line, I'm going to have a new state that an electron can tunnel into, a new pathway for current transport, and that's going to give me a little step in current or a peak in the conductance. And so simply you know, measuring the conductance through a dot is a really good probe of the internal energy level structure, and if you can really resolve these discrete quantum states just through a low temperature transport measure. Okay. So that's all charge, we're not yet to spin. How about spin? Well, what happens when I take this level, for example, and go to five tesla, how's the picture change? Anyone know? Spin up and spin down as zero field are degenerate. At five tesla, how's it look? Each one's gonna Zeeman split, right? And, uh, and so you'll see at you know, low magnetic fields, I have a Cromer's doublet. As we increase the magnetic field, spin up and spin down, split by the Zeeman energy, and you'll actually see uh, peak splitting. At both fields, they'll have a single conductance peak, but as you increase the magnetic field, you can tunnel through you know, either the spin up or spin down state associated with that electron number. And so again, through conductance measurements, you can really resolve the amon splitting of a single quantum state you know, in a device like this. I kind of flashed through this quickly. These are really beautiful data I'm taken back when I was an undergrad. It was really a, inspiring data set. This is a plot of conductance through a vertical quantum dot as a function of the source range bias voltage and gate voltage. And what these data show, this is the electron number in the quantum dot starting from zero, one electron, two electrons, three, four, five, six, is evidence for shell filling, like you would see you know, in a chemical system as you add electrons and sort of obey Hund's rules. And so if you have a very spherically symmetric quantum dot, you'll actually see shell filling in the addition spectrum as you add electrons to the device. And so this is another kind of close connection to, let's say, you know, atomic physics or this artificial atom picture that we're really making 100 nanometer scale systems, but they behave almost like you know, real atomic physics systems in terms of their electronic structure. Okay, so we did good. Any questions about conductance, sorry, charging energy, and particle in the box orbital energy. Those are the two numbers to sort of take away. Um, charging energy is the cost to add an electron to the dot. It's about five or 10 milli electron volts. And then you have the particle in a box energy scale. What's the energy scale between the discrete electron and states? That depends on how small the box is, right? Uh, but for typical device sizes that we make in the lab today, those orbital energy scales can be a few milli. So those are the two energy scales. And then Xamon's going to be important later on. Doing good so far? Okay. Well, let me get into the kind of more technical part of the talk and describe how we actually build these things. How, how can we build a cage around a single electron? And the, the, this field predates me. The early work in the field was done in the gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide material system because there was a tremendous amount of work done in this material system probing quantum hall physics and fractional quantum hall physics. And basically, this is band structure engineering. You can grow through molecular beam epitaxy layered systems. In this case, it's gallium arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide. These have different band gaps. And by doping the aluminum gallium arsenide layer uh, with donors, with end doping it, uh, you can create a two-dimensional electron gas at the interface between the higher band gap material, aluminum gallium arsenide, and the lower band gap material, gallium arsenide. So right at this interface, you'll have a sheet of electrons. 
And that's called a two-dimensional electron gas. Right? And uh, as I said before, the, the growth of this header structure you know, in the z direction confines the electrons in a plane. And we want to put the electrons in a box. We need to build the other walls of the cage. And the way that's done typically is by fabricating some gate electrodes on top of the header structure and biasing those gate electrodes at negative voltages to kind of push the electron into a corner. Think of it that way. This is a really simple example of a device called a quantum point contact. The kind of grayish region that you see here, that's the two-dimensional electron gas. In the absence of these gate electrodes, it would just be a 2D sheet of electrons, you know, with the typical densities of say 2 times 10 to the 11 per centimeter squared. Now if you make these gate electrodes negative, the negative voltages on the gates are going to repel electrons in the 2D gas. And that's called depletion. And the depletion regions are the shaded, kind of white out, white out regions here. So those areas are depleted. And what the quantum point contact does is it forces electrons to go through a little constriction. It's like a one-dimensional channel. And uh, in these early devices, quantum point contacts, that's where conductance quantization and some of the first demonstrations of, say, mesoscopic physics were really performed in these types of devices. Over the years, there's been an evolution in terms of the complexity of quantum dot devices. You know, one direction in scaling has been the number of electrons. Some of the early experiments were performed by uh, you know, groups that had devices that trapped hundreds of electrons inside of the quantum dot device. And by just scaling down over the years, uh, the single electron, Q electron regime was reached just by lithographically making smaller and smaller devices. Another thing that's happened in terms of complexity is that this is a single quantum dot, but you can take two dots and put them right next to each other and make a double quantum dot. That's like your artificial molecule. This is an example of a triple quantum dot. There are dots A, B, and C. These are kind of coupled together. A is coupled to B, B is coupled to C. And then recently we've taken steps in my group to make big chains of dots. This is nine quantum dots in series, each one nearest neighbor coupled, you know, the one to the left of it and the one to the right of it. And then we have some other quantum dots that are used for detection and actually determining what's going on in the experiment. Okay. So a question about this. So sure. I mean, this, and this, in the top two things, like the, the stuff, the length scale, like the same. Like, so how did, how does it go from 100 to 1? You know, what, what happened in these, uh, these types of devices is that say that the, the groups kind of got confused that we're taking the measurements because to, to probe these devices you need to measure conductance. And so in the early experiments the conductance going to zero was taken as a signature as the electron number going to zero. And that's not always a true statement because you could have electrons sort of pushed way back here in the device but not be able to get current in through the entry door and exit door of the quantum dot. And what we call these kind of lobster claw designs, but what this device design does is it, it sort of pushes a single electron right in there so that you can still get current through that quantum state and, and resolve it. And so I think I have a slide on charge detection kind of clarify that. But there's not a big difference here, but it's, it's a, there's a kind of a big difference in, in, the, in the way to measure, I'd say, in the way the, the geometry of the gains. The geometry of the gains. It really difference. makes a big difference, yeah. Yes. So you talk about them sort of talking with the left and the right, but why would you have a why doesn't you start getting band structure out of this when you have this many? Oh, uh, this many dots? Yeah. We're just getting to the point where we can kind of load this up to one 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 electron occupancy. And that's that's an interesting picture to look at. You know, for qubit experiments, you almost always want each electron to just be really isolated from everything else, right? But there's a different regime where if we pull the barriers down between the, the dots, we should see this crossover. And that's a, a different direction of physics that we're pursuing, you know, in addition to the key work. Yeah. When you have an array like that, what is the, the parameter which uh, uh, determines the hopping strength? It's like inter dot tunnel coupling. Uh, yeah, but that's what we call it. Like, how do you control? How do you control it? There's a marker here. Basically, uh, I'll draw you know, a picture for a simple case of just a double quantum dot. There's a double dot with one electron in it. We can put the electron in the left by tilting it with gate voltages, or put it in the right by tilting the gate voltages the other way. Just by adjusting the, making the right gate more positive in that picture is going to pull the electron to the right side of the device. So if you have a double wall potential, you can kind of do that. So that's 
controlling where the electron's sitting. And then in terms of the tunnel coupling, you can imagine going from a, a case like this where I have a pretty high barrier height, right, to a, a case like this where I somehow adjust that barrier height by tuning, for example, uh, this voltage here and, and that voltage there. Yeah. So there are kind of ways to separate the different parts of the quantum dot. It's clear in this device. You can imagine putting an electron here and an electron there, and by adjusting this gate voltage and that gate voltage, kind of separating the two chambers, the left side and the right side. That's how you adjust the tunnel coupling. So for the multiple dots yeah. array, do you have more? We have a bunch of electrons. I think I have a picture I'll show you later. Like, <laughs> yeah. Another question? Uh, how do the three bottom dots, I guess, measure what's going up on the large row of dots? Is it kind of like capacitively coupled or something? Um, it's a question how do I use these to measure yeah. these? Yeah, we use charge detection. I, I think I have thrown a slide in here. I was really struggling, JP, to figure out what to put into a one hour lecture. <laughs> I do my best here, and we can always talk during the lunch break. All right, here it is, charge detection. Okay, so one way to measure dots is to look at these Coulomb oscillations. But as I mentioned in response to your question, if the barriers get closed, you can't measure conductance. So you're kind of blind, even if there are electrons inside, you can't see them through current measurement. So this is a technique called charge detection that was developed in 1993 in this paper by Thiel et al. And what they did is they took a quantum dot and right next to it, they fabricated a quantum point contact. And you can think of that as a, a very sensitive nanoscale kind of field effect transistor that the current through this quantum point contact is very sensitive to the local electrostatic environment. So the conductance is going to pinch off as the gate voltage is made more negative, like a transistor would. But if there's anything else in the environment, like a local charge that moves, it also changes the conductance of that, that constriction. And what they show through these measurements, these are the standard Coulomb oscillations probed by measuring conductance through the quantum dot. At the same time, they measured the conductance through this constriction here, this charge sensor. And you can see that, that as you make the gate voltage more negative, the detector resistance goes up. That's because you're pinching the channel off. It's getting narrower and narrower. But every time you kick an electron out, you know, there's a change in conductance. And so you can resolve that. And so this is single charge detection. And this device here is made so that we have three charge detectors that can kind of look up at that nine dot array. And we can look you know, right in the middle or left to probe what the occupancy of the nine side array is using mm -hmm. those charge detectors. But this was a real breakthrough for our field you know, in many respects in terms of how things can be done. OK, now we talk about materials issues and how many of you take quantum mechanics? So you go through the hydrogen atom calculation and you calculate all these effects. Somewhere toward the end of that chapter, Griffiths is like hyperfine, right? Hyperfine means like you don't really care about it. <laughs> and, but if you look at electron spin states and semiconductors, like this is a crucial importance for, for what I do for a living. And so here's the physics. You know, we have this picture of a decline of potential. It's parabolic. It's always drawn as parabolic in theory. You put an electron in it and you attach a spin to it, that's your qubit, and that's kind of the end of the story. You forget about all the properties of the materials, and that, that's wrong, because this electron has a G factor that's set by the electronic band structure of gallium arsenide or silicon, or wherever we make the device out. It has an effective mass that's set by the electronic band structure of the material that we work with. And that electron's also sitting, you know, its wave function is delocalized in a bath of lattice nuclei that can have spin. And in the case of 3-5 semiconductors like gallium arsenide, all of the lattice nuclei carry spin 3 halves. So the right picture to have in your mind is we have a spin, it's trapped in a quantum dot, but that electron spin is coupled to about a million lattice nuclei through the hyperfine interaction. And this is not a small correction in this problem. It can be a big correction. Let me give you an example of scale. All right, here's a Hamiltonian if you want to understand it from the field perspective. Take an electron and put it in a field, its energy level is aiming to it. That's the first term. Now if you think about this term, what this term says is that the spin of the electron is coupled to each nuclear spin that its wave function overlaps with. And if that sum is zero, right, it's no big deal. But put the idea of scale, if we were to fully polarize this nuclear spin bath, 
the electron spin would experience an effective overhauser field or nuclear field of five tesla, a really big magnetic field. And so, you know, even if the spins are on polarized, they're going to be root mean square fluctuations in this field that give you an overhauser field typically <coughs> of a couple of millitesla. Hyperfine's big, at least in Galley Mars 9. And this was measured in early experiments where we took two electrons, prepared them in a spin singlet state, we separated the electrons and just let them sit. We did what's called a free evolution experiment. And after some wait time, we tried to put them back together. And the idea is that if you start in a singlet, separate, you can return to a singlet, everything good. But if you prepare the two electrons in a singlet state, separate them, and there's some dephasing process that rotates one of the spins, and you end up in a triplet state, and at the end of the day, you can't recombine them due to the poly principle. And we saw this in this decay of the singlet state probability as a function of the spin separation time. And in this early experiment, we showed that the dephasing time was 10 nanoseconds, and that 10 nanoseconds is consistent with this hyperfine picture. Okay. Right, so I think bottom line number three, is that nuclear spins are really important for spins in semiconductors if you want to look at electron spin coherence. Here's another issue. There's a question earlier about Zeeman splitting. This is about 20 gigahertz. Typically, that Zeeman splitting is set by the current going through our superconducting magnet, which is really solid. But if you think about the total field that the electron spin sees, it sees the field from the superconducting magnet plus this internal overhauser field. And if that internal overhauser field is fluctuating, the Zeeman splitting is fluctuating too. And that means if you try to drive an electron spin resonance rotation between those two states, there's going to be an error. And this is really a you know, tour de force experiment by Frank Coppins at the Delft Group in 2006. I'm not trying to criticize it in any way, but if you look at these Robby oscillations, you know, they're not really sine wave kind of features like you'd expect to see. They're strongly damped. And that's because there are errors in the rotation around the block sphere because you're not really on resonance ever because the Zeeman splitting is bouncing around all the time. And you don't know what frequency to drive your qubit at because of these nuclei. I'll contrast this with silicon in a few minutes and you'll see a marked difference, even in natural silicon. I'll just do a version. Okay, so early work was done in three fives. I think you've seen some of that uh, through this paper here. And many of these SEM images, basically all of them are taken from Galilee Marsonite devices. What we're working on now is silicon. And one of the main reasons is just in terms of making scalable devices. We have this whole you know, industrial complex based on making very small transistors in silicon. And we'd like to leverage that, hopefully, someday. We make many qubits. Another thing that I hope you just learned is that purity is equal to coherence when you talk about qubits, whether it's a superconducting qubit, a trapped ion qubit, a spin qubit. For our spin qubits, we really care about isotopic enrichment and that kind of purity metric, but how clean is our system in terms of spin coherence. And, uh, and so the, the early experiment I showed you, Galli yeah, Marsonide, is you know, like way out here, T2 is 10 to the minus 8 nan you know, seconds, 10 nanoseconds basically. This is a theory prediction from Maryland. This is the Sharma's group and Wayne Witzel, who I think was a postdoc with this, with this group. This is a prediction of the T2, the electron spin coherence time in silicon as a function of isotopic enrichment. So getting pure and pure means going to the left on the slide. And you can see that for every decade in improvement in isotopic enrichment, you get a decade improvement in electron spin coherence. And so there's a big payoff here. In silicon, if you can get rid of the silicon 29, the spin carrying isotope, and you're just left with spin silicon 28 and silicon 30, right, there can be a massive payoff in terms of coherence times. But how long that quantum state can actually persist? What really motivated you know, me and my group to move to silicon are some experiments. It's by Steve Lyons group. These are both electron spin resonance experiments, not in a single spin limit, but more like you know, 10 to the 20 spins. These are big samples. But they show that for spins in silicon, you could have coherence times of order about 10 seconds. This is an experiment from Michael Thaywald's group in Canada, where they looked at <coughs> nuclear spin coherence. So these are a technique called electron nuclear double resonance 
transfer coherence to a nuclear spin state of phosphorus donors and silicon. And then they actually warmed that sample up to room temperature, let it sit there for like 40 minutes, cooled it back down and measured it. And they showed that there was actually quantum memory that, that worked at room temperature. So you can basically have like 40 minutes of coherence <laughs> using the nuclear spin state. It's pretty cool. Is that long enough? <laughs> times, right? Okay. There's a cost that you pay though by moving to silicon. There are two costs that you pay, two prices. First, we were really spoiled in three fives because these are small effective mass systems. You know, like indium arsenide, <coughs> indium antimonide, all have very small effective mass. I think business is another special material with extremely small effective mass. So you can see quantum effects in a pretty large system. If you go to silicon, you know, the mass isn't one, but it's much closer to one than again. I've learned an idea, effective mass of about 0.2. And that means that if we want to see quantum effects, we need to make a much smaller box in the laboratory, a much smaller quantum device, right? Quantum energy scale is a h, or h, h bar squared k squared over 2m, right? So think of that as m star. Small m star means large energy. But if you jack up the effective mass, then you need to make a smaller box to see the same energy scale. And so that's the physics that comes into play here. You'll see how that pans out in terms of devices. Another thing that's important in the system of valleys is that uh, instead of having all the electrons at the center of the Bruin zone like we do in gallic arsenide, is a more complicated electronic band structure. Or so I'm feeling tight here. You have 15 minutes. Okay, good. So this is the hard part for us, really the materials aspects. And I told you a lot about the spin physics and the device physics, but if this doesn't work, nothing works. And there was a period of two or three years where really nothing worked in the lab. <laughs> okay, all right, step one is when you need a good header structure. And this is a cross-sectional TM image of a silicon, silicon germanium header structure that we had grown by a foundry using a process called chemical vapor deposition. And so you start with a silicon wafer, you grow what's called a silicon germanium relaxed buffer substrate. This is the silicon quantum well. That's where we want the electrons to sit to make this 2D plane, the electrons, the 2D gas. And then there's a barrier here that keeps the electrons away from all the badness, which is the outside world. <laughs> right? So that kind of is a barrier header structure. And then there's a silicon cap that keeps everything from oxidizing, you know, through the germanium. So first question, you're all kind of materials folks. I want the electrons in silicon. Why is it? that this works at all. I don't want electrons here. This is probably, arguably, probably one of the most important materials, right? After water and oxygen is a necessary for our survival in carbon. But what's the band gap of silicon? Does anyone know? 1.1 EDS on mounted up there. Anyone know what the band gap of uranium is? It's not quite business element level, but it's, it's smaller. It's about 0.66 EV. So how can I get electrons in silicon? This band gap is almost twice the band gap of germanium. Herein lies the kind of materials problem, right? And so one way to get around this is I want electronic confinement here, but if the conduction band edge in silicon is much higher than it is in germanium, I can't do that. I need to shift the conduction band edges around. So we make an alloy of silicon germanium here. This is a silicon 0.7 germanium 0.3 in a real experiment. Another crucial thing is strain. There's a tremendous amount of work that went into uh, strain engineering these substrates. And you use actually the deformation potential to pull the conduction mat edge and silicon down low enough that you'll have electronic confinement in that quantum well layer. And so the lattice constant mismatch between silicon and germanium is about 4%. So this is a tensile strain silicon quantum well. And it's through that strain engineering that you'll have electron <coughs> confinement in that quantum well and not the opposite. Okay. And uh, this is a, there's a nice review article I can point you to if you're interested in this by uh, Schaffler, who did a lot of early work in Abstrider on molecular beam epitaxy and CD growth for new materials. But that's a long learning process of actually getting that right. 
right? And the, here's a, actually the reference for Shafter's review article if you want to look at it, but you know, the strain plays an extremely important role in terms of both the band structure and the value of the and so on. Okay. I mentioned also, in addition to valleys, we care about effective mass. And this is kind of you know, a cartoon picture of an early Galley arsenic quantum dot device. The dots in here, that's where the electrons are confined. And uh, later on, Charlie Marcus and Mark's, Mike Snowman did some simulations of the more modern devices. This is a double quantum dot. This is the picture of the electrostatic confinement potential for trapping electrons. And I uh, apologize for the lack of scale bar here, but you can trust me, this is about a micron across. These are microfabricated gates. And the electrons sit in these two minimums. This is the left dot and that's the right dot. And what you can see from the simulation is that the size of the electron in this system is small. And we're using these massive gates around the outside to kind of try to push it around. And, and so there's a little bit of an issue, you know, if you want to control a single electron wave function, I think that you need little pokers that have about the size of the single electron wave function. You're not going to do it with a big pile or something, right? And uh, for silicon, that was really important. So what we do now for silicon is we make more complex devices where we gate the electrons actually from the top of the header structure. So that instead of making a cage around it, we'll put a piece of metal right above it and there's big capacitive coupling between the electron and that electrode. So it was a much more complicated and intensive fabrication process. It took a few years for us to get it right. And, and you'll see the evolution of that in the next couple of slides. But basically we used overlapping layers of aluminum and a native aluminum oxide barrier to insulate those layers from each other. And we take from the top. Here's an example of how we do this. This is a simple device for a single silicon germanium quantum dot. Um, think about trapping an electron, what would you want to do? I want to have a potential at a sharp point, and I want to pull a single electron underneath it. And how would you make that? Well, I'd like to have a wire come down from the ceiling and do it for me, right? <laughs> that's how I'd like to do it, but it's hard to fabricate that. And so what we do is we make a screening layer of aluminum. It's our first layer of metal. That screens out the electrostatic fields from the subsequent layers of metal. Uh, layer two is going to be positively biased to pull electrons underneath these gates. And then someone was asking about how do I adjust the uh, barrier height. We do that by adjusting the voltages on layer three, which are like our barrier gates in this device design. So it's three <laughs> layers of lithography. These are the Coulomb oscillations from the single quantum dot. What we like about this device design is that you can kind of scale it up reasonably easily. This is a device we call double double. It's two double quantum dots, one up here and uh, one up here. And it's reconfigurable because we're working in uh, accumulation mode. So you can easily go from a single dot to a double quantum dot. Here's a picture of this device tuned up as two single dots. So a single dot here, coupled to source and drain electrodes, and a single dot here, coupled to source and drain electrodes. Uh, by just adjusting these voltages on the right hand side of the device, we can make that kind of double up potential. That's kind of a double <coughs> quantum dot. And there you see a very different charging diagram. Okay? All right. Uh, let's scale this up. In 1D, we at least think we have a path forward. You know, you have kind of a unit cell like you would think of in condensed matter physics, and you just stamp that out to make a larger array. And that's kind of worked. Here's a single dot, a double dot, a triple dot. And this device is probably going to keep us busy for the next few years. It's a 12 dot device. There are nine dots on top and three, three dots below. Okay. So there's a lot of things we can do that. So to get something like that, is that a, is there a long road to get into a working device like that and then you use it for a long time? Or? Yeah, I'd say, you know, the, the kind of tension in my department is that uh, I have materials people across the hall like on on. And like every week he's looking at a different incentive. And we'll have the same hole for like a year. <laughs> so he's like dancing in circles around my group. And we're looking at the same device. So it's kind of a different mode of operation. It yeah. took us a long time to get this to work, with even that simplest device design. So how many devices were fabricated to get to the work? I think that there's a long learning process of how to make these layers of metal not leak to each other, not leak to the substrate and all that. And, and that took us probably two years. But then after that, I think you know, going from just a single to, to just changing the cat and 
and kind of building it. And now our, our yield with these devices is quite high. Once we figured out the shock gear heights and how to get home in contacts and just soaking and all that. But yeah, I say that the time scale of the experience is, is very different. We get the same cold, stays cold until last Wednesday when we had a power outage. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you just you sort of pump as much physics out of it as you can, right? And then, then you pump in these devices. So it's, it's a little bit different. Okay. Um, someone's asking you about how many wires do you have going in. Here's a, an image showing if you were to look, visit my lab and look at the cryostat, there are about 50 wires coming out the top. And each wire biases one of these pieces of metal. But, but you know, it's doable. And I give us this, uh, this is theory, but this is the electron density in the plane of the Coulomb well. And you can see nine dots in a chain and three single charge detectors. So that's you know, the materials background, isotopic enrichment is important. Effective mass, high effective mass systems are difficult to work with, but there are ways to get around it and to still be able to trap electrons. And uh, I just want to talk about a couple of other features that are important. Spin orbit coupling can be used in a good way for spin control. Ideally, we like to do everything electrically. And there are you know, theories of, let's say, dot and dot spin transistor and using spin orbit coupling to make non-electron devices one of the things that we can do in our device is if we have strong enough spin orbit coupling, we can take a single electron and shake its orbital position. And through the spin orbit interaction, the Rashbaugh spin orbit interaction, that orbital shaking looks like an oscillating magnetic field. And that magnetic field can be used to drive the electron spin resonance transitions. Uh, in gallic arsenide, that barely worked. Here's some recent data from our group last year. You can look at the reference here, where we were driving single spin Rabi oscillations. This is a natural silicon. It's not even a good isotopically enriched silicon. But these Rabi oscillations are driven electrically. And the way that we can do it in silicon, which has a weak intrinsic spin orbit interaction, is we take our quantum device and we fabricate a little cobalt micromagnet on top of it. And that cobalt micromagnet has a very large fringing field. And if we shake the electron position in that fringing field, the Zeeman energy of the electron changes, and the quantization axis is kind of spin dependent. So it's like a cooked up spin orbit coupling that you make through magnetic field gradient engineering. Um, another thing that we can do is we can adjust this barrier height here quickly on a nanosecond time scale. And what that does is we'll have two electrons that are, there's no wave function overlap, the exchange coupling is zero. We pull that barrier height down. We momentarily push the electrons together. That turns on an exchange coupling. And you can use the exchange interaction to uh, implement a two qubit gate. And so this is a demonstration of a controlled knot operation using two spins and time dependent control of the wave function overlap. Okay. So I'd say that now that's kind of the materials physics from this side is that right, there's the, the materials physics of how you build the device, but then there's the work like this, which is right, an engineer, a Hamiltonian. And I can look at how the ground state changes as we change couplings and energy scales. They make more complex devices. And I think that's you know, another materials aspect of this very device-oriented physics. It's kind of like the cold atom systems. But here, you know, we're really working in a, a low temperature limit where the, all the energy scales, the tunneling, the orbital energies are, are much higher than KT. And you could really imagine looking at the exotic quantum phases of these systems. OK. Let me talk about an ongoing materials challenge. When you think about your qubit, regardless of what it is, every solid state interaction that you can think of is pretty much trying to poke at it and destroy the, the quantum coherence. And one thing I haven't talked about yet is the ongoing materials challenge is charge noise. Um, there are fluctuations. There are two-level systems. And, you know, Defects in materials at these interfaces and our oxides are amorphous and aluminum oxide. And these fluctuating two level systems lead to charge noise, a fluctuating electrostatic background. This is known as well wrap noise in condensed matter physics and you know, other, other contexts. And kind of silver lining of this transition from gallium arsenide to silicon is that we no longer work with a doped material system that has donors that are kind of randomly ionized. We got rid of all the dopants by switching to silicon, and that's been good. So actually, a factor of 200 improvement 
in terms of our, our charge coherence and silicon devices. And so we're still looking at this, thinking about ways to passivate surfaces and make cleaner interfaces. And I think that materials will continue to have an important role in this field as well as, say, superconducting units, just in terms of cleaning things up. Probably about out of time. A couple minutes. A couple minutes. So let me just flash through this quickly. It's just, I think, one of the most exciting results from our group the past year. And you know, imagine this. I show you this double well potential. You can push the electrons together and momentarily turn on exchange doubling. Right? That's how we implement the two cubic gate. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a chip and we could entangle you know, any spin with any other spin on the chip? Even if they weren't the nearest neighbor couple, right? There are a billion reasons why you might want to do that. And the, the approach that we're trying to take in the lab is a couple of spin to light coherently <coughs> and use light as like a router to transfer quantum information across the chip, right? Because exchange coupling is necessarily short range. It's based on weight function overlap. You don't always have that. You might want a couple of spin one to spin four, and using light is a possible way to sort of get out of the plane and, and couple larger distances. So the first step is to demonstrate a coherent coupling between spin and light. And this is an experiment that kind of you know, combines a lot of things. We're using silicon, the coherence times are long. We're using micromagnets to generate large magnetic field gradients and a large synthetic spin orbit coupling. And what we showed is that we can make a device, we can take a quantum dot device that we talked about for the past hour, and we can build a cavity around it that will trap a microwave frequency photon that is matched to that 20 gigahertz Amon splitting or 10 gigahertz Amon splitting. And what we see is that when we increase the magnetic field and tune the Zeeman energy of the single spin into resonance with a photon in the cavity, we see this avoided crossing, which is a demonstration of a coherent coupling between these two distinct quantum degrees of freedom. It shows that we have a superposition of not you know, light and charge, but actually spin and charge, spin and light. You know, so it's, it's a combination of the spin state that's hybridized with the single photonic state. And this coupling can be quite large. It can be on the order of, say, tens of megahertz. It's coherent coupling. Another thing that's cool about it, right, is there's been a lot of work in condensed matter physics trying to use a, you know, detectors to detect a single spin. And recently there's been a lot of work on using nitrogen vacancy centers to detect spin states. And in our field, our measurements have always been like very destructive. You want to measure the spin state of a single electron. The way we did it in the past, you would have to kind of throw that electron away and couple it to a Fermi since it was gone forever. You could never use that, that electron again. Um, and when you have coupling to light, you can shine a microwave signal into the cavity, measure the transmission through the cavity, and you can actually use the light field of that cavity to very weakly interrogate the spin state of the single electron. And what's shown here, I recognize that once this quickly, but these are Rabi oscillations of a single spin that are detected using basically a single photon kind of measurement, microwave frequency photon. So now we have really shown that we can coherently couple you know, charge and spin and light together in these devices. And I think this next step, I'm hoping it happens this year, is to be able to entangle two spins that are separated by about a centimeter using this approach of a single photon. <coughs> okay. So I got chewed up an hour. I'll stop here. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.